This is the Energy Education Podcast for January 13th, 2013. I'm Kevin Hurley. Today on the show, we'll talk about what are likely the three most problematic nuclear power plants in the U.S. First, uncertainty at the Fort Calhoun plant regarding issues of possible flood risk have been a topic of conversation for some time. Now, a former government geologist is weighing in on the issue. We'll take a closer look at what he's saying. Next, the Crystal River nuclear plant has spent four years asking themselves one question. We'll talk about that too. Also on the show, we'll talk about the highly controversial issue of recycling radioactive materials from nuclear power plants back into the consumer product line. Now, to discuss all of this and more, we're joined by Fairwind's chief nuclear engineer, Arnie Gunderson. Arnie, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Kevin. Thanks for having me yet again. Well, some more news coming out of the situation in Missouri with the Fort Calhoun plant and the possible risk uh, from flooding in, in the event of a uh, failure of an upstream dam. Can you start off today just by talking a little bit about that? Yeah. You, you know, we've been talking about four nuclear reactors out of the 104 in the nuclear fleet. And those four are the, the two at San Onofre, um, the Fort Calhoun, and Crystal River. All of them have been shut down now for more than a year. Uh, they seem to be the uh, the bad apples in the in the nuclear uh, bushel basket right now. All three of them had um, major news this week. Well, then why don't we start off with Fort Calhoun and uh, talk a little bit about what's happening in Missouri this week? Well, Fort Calhoun continues to be shut down, and now they're saying, well, sometime in the first quarter of 2013, it's likely to start up. But I think that'll get pushed out and out and out, as we discussed in the last podcast. Just this week, they were looking for some pipes, and they weren't where the as-built drawings said they were. So this issue of configuration management continues. But also, uh, what what is really, really important for the safety of the entire Midwest is this issue that we've been talking about now for 18 months, and that's the failure of an upstream dam from from Fort Calhoun. You you know, you might remember that the plant was entirely flooded and they had uh, sandbagged the plant. And of course I said on, I I think, Democracy Now! that sandbags and nuclear power plants don't belong in the same paragraph. Well, uh, I'm not alone in that concern. There's a a person has come forward. Uh, His name is Dr. Bernard Shanks, S-H-A-N-K-S. And He's a heavy hitter. He's been in many, many positions of responsibility, uh, including in California and and throughout the country as director of different agencies. And he basically has said exactly the same thing that I did. So Dr. Shank's position is that the upstream dams are in such poor condition because they're so old that they could fail and if we have a, a condition where there's a lot of water behind the dams, like two years ago, the, uh, the failure of one dam could cause all of the others to cascade. Now, what that means is that all the way down in St. Louis, which is a long way down, people would be waist deep in water. But more importantly, up at the Fort Calhoun plant, we're looking at 35 feet more water than there was just in the in the flood 18 months ago. We're not talking about the little facility on the water where the service water pumps are. Uh, that would obviously be inundated. But 35 for more feet of water would, um, would flood an awful lot of the safety-related components. This plant isn't designed for the failure of an upstream dam. During Fukushima Daiichi, I said that if the Unit 4 fuel pool catches fire, it would be uh, Chernobyl on steroids. Well, well Dr. Dr. Shanks has a, a, a quote that's similarly important and frightening. He said that if a uh, upstream dam were to fail, it would cause a flood of biblical proportions. So these plants are not designed against biblical floods. These plants were right at their limit that back in the flooding two years ago. So. You know, we've got two issues at Fort Calhoun that are keeping the plant shut down. The first is that they don't know how it's built and they can't find the right drawings and the right calculations. 
that's bad enough. But the, the bigger issue is, according to Dr. Shanks and, and many other uh, geologists and hydrologists, the condition of the upstream dams is suspect. So, Arnie, you've been talking for a long time about the potential risk to some nuclear power plants in the event that they lose their ultimate heat sink. And that's to say, if they lose their water pumps, just like Fukushima did during the 2011 tsunami. Now, if I understand you, what you're saying now is that in the case of Fort Calhoun, if an upstream dam were to break, that this, this is a bigger problem than simply losing the water pumps and losing the ultimate heat sink. Yeah, that's exactly right. At Fort Calhoun, if an upstream dam were to fail, um, we're not talking about a couple more feet of water. We're talking about you know, 35 more feet of water. The, the other plant that falls in that category is the Oconee units that are downstream of a very large dam as well. And um, it wouldn't just flood the, the emergency service water pumps, but it would likely flood other safety-related structures too. So there's two that are in the category of uh, uh, an upstream dam doesn't just wipe out the service water, but likely floods other safety-related stuff. You know, Dr. Shanks has also said that he has evidence that shows that during the flooding, the Army Corps of Engineers was frantically trying to shore up those upstream dams. They added some uh, a foot of height to one of the dams, and uh, down at the bottom of another dam, they shored it up because there were indications that it was weak at its base. So we are not really talking about some kind of an academic once in a million year exercise here, but we came close two years ago. And uh, whether the Army Corps of Engineers wants to admit it or not, th these dams are old. And uh, in the event of uh, an another flood like we had on the Missouri just two years ago, we would put the entire Midwest in jeopardy, not just from the flood, but of course from a, a nuclear accident as well. So following the meltdowns in Japan, many of the U.S. nuclear authorities said that uh, we were safe here in the U.S. because a tsunami like that couldn't happen here. But with this new information, uh, it sounds like what you're saying is that essentially uh, a tsunami like that, an inland tsunami, could happen here. Oh, yeah. Th these, uh, this is an inland tsunami, if you will. You know, These plants are, you know, Fukushima at least was designed for a, 12 or 15 foot tsunami and these plants aren't designed for that at all so it's not just the height of the wave it's but also it's what the plant is designed to withstand and no one is assuming the uh, the worst case which is the upstream dam failure you know you look at these dams and they're pretty substantial you look at them and say wow that's going to last forever but if you looked at fukushima daiichi one day before the accident you wouldn't believe that a a 45-foot tall wave would have hit it either. Um, Mother Nature can do things that in our wildest dreams we can't imagine happening. You know, we've posted some some articles written by Dr. Shanks are, are going to be posted next to this podcast on the web. So if readers are interested in finding out more about Dr. Shanks, uh, some of his material is uh, on the on our website. So, Arnie, did Dr. Shank say how likely he thought an event like this was? He is concerned that it's a lot more likely than the Army Corps of Engineers is willing to let on. Um, I think his biggest concern is the age of these dams. These things are, uh, you know, they, they date back into the 30s, from uh, uh, between the 30s and the 50s, when we were um, doing vast public construction. So we're talking about structures now that are, you know, a half a century old. That gives Dr. Shanks a cause for concern. Now moving on to another plant that you've put in the bad bushel category, the Crystal River plant. Crystal River has spent the past four years asking themselves one question. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, the, the story on Crystal River is that in 2009, they were going to replace their, um, their steam generators. And rather than get someone who had familiarity with cutting uh, the nuclear containment in half to slide the uh, steam generators in, they decided that they were going to do it themselves. You know, it's sort of like, well, they slept at a, 
Holiday Inn Express, so therefore they became experts. Well, the net effect of that was that when they cut this huge hole in the side of the containment, it cracked. And the containment crack was about 40 to 60 feet long and about 20 feet high. And it ran around like, a, uh, like the belt on a radial tire. It ran all the way around the containment. They then said, well, we'll fix it. They spent a year trying to fix it. They tightened it up again. And it cracked not once more, but twice more. People on it could actually feel the building vibrate when these, uh, uh, when these cracks propagate it. So they thought they had it right when they did it the first time. They didn't. They thought they had it right when they did it the second time, and they didn't. And so they've been shut down since 2009 and not generating any power, yet they're paying their staff, they're paying the security, they're paying the uh, operators to requalify, paying the engineers to keep the plant. They, they probably spent upwards of close to a billion dollars already keeping a plant that can't run staff with, a, with its professional complement. So just this week, they met in, uh, in, in Florida with the regulators, and they said they're still not sure they're going to fix it. They then went on to say that they're still negotiating with the insurance company, and depending on what the insurance company just says, they may, they may pull the plug. But in the meantime, Floridians are continuing to pay exorbitant rates for a plant that doesn't, doesn't run. You know, it's sort of like having the, uh, a professional football team have the quarterback get injured. Well, the, this quarterback is going to be injured for six or seven years, but yet Florida Power and Light is expecting the season ticket holders to keep paying to come to games that don't get played. I don't think that's a, a, a reasonable way to run a business. Basically, they're soaking the ratepayers of Florida in an attempt to keep this idled plant from going belly up. So it's been four years, and they're still trying to make a decision. That's right. That's right. They, the, the previous owner was Progress Energy, and they sold to Duke. And Duke is uh, seriously considering pulling the plug on the plant. It's interesting because last week we had a uh, financial analyst at UBS suggest that uh, Vermont Yankee didn't make any economic sense. And this week, we've got a financial analyst at, uh, at another firm called Fitch. And he says that the um, Crystal River plant will likely be closed because Duke can't make economic sense out of it. So, you know, the dominoes are starting to fall. We've had Kiwani, uh, which is shutting down in the Midwest because of uh, financial reasons. And now we've got UBS analysts and Fitch analysts also claiming that it makes no economic sense to keep uh, other nuclear plants running. We're going to post that Fitch uh, story on the website so people can, uh, uh, can read about it as well. Moving on, Congressman Markey has recently stated that he doesn't believe it's a good idea to recycle radioactive scrap metals and reintroduce them into consumer products. Um, however, the Department of Energy and primarily Secretary Chu have been pushing for this for quite some time. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, th this idea of taking radioactive nuclear material and throwing it back into a smelter and uh, with some clean uh, iron ore and making uh, less contaminated radioactive nuclear steel that then enters into consumer products that's been around for, for years and years and years. You know, I think it's important to examine why we're doing this, why we're proposing doing this. Right now, radioactive material from inside a nuclear plant is not supposed to be melted down and sold as scrap iron. And, and there's a good reason for that. Obviously, it's radioactive and there are health hazards associated with it. But what the industry has been lobbying for for years is to turn a liability, these huge radioactive vessels that are sitting in their, on their property or sitting out on the Idaho desert, to turn these liabilities into assets to sell the scrap metal. So rather than pay someone to take it, they, are, they view this opportunity as a chance to get paid to sell it as waste scrap. So um, I don't think... About go ahead. Talking about the... Um... Uh, nuclear waste itself, then. We're talking about the metal that's used in the containments and in the structures. 
that's being irradiated from being in contact with the uh, nuclear fuel. Yes, that's right. We're not talking about selling radioactive waste. We're talking about selling the iron and steel that a nuclear plant is made of and then shipping that to a smelter where their other iron and steel would be added and uh, it would get melted down and the radioactivity from the nuclear stuff would get spread out into other non-radioactive steel. So this stuff the, could become pots and this stuff could become pans or forks, knives, spoons, uh, anything metal in the consumer product line? Yeah, there's already been cases of radioactive material getting into the consumer product line. Um, there's been a couple in India and China where radioactive cobalt that's used in x-ray sources has gotten into their smelters and been shipped out as consumer products. Bed Bath & Beyond just had some radioactive steel arrive at their plant in the form of uh, tissue boxes to, uh, to, to hold tissue paper. And... Uh, it was only after the stuff actually was in their stores that they discovered that, in fact, their display case was radioactive. So this stuff has snuck into the waste stream already. But what the Secretary of Energy is saying, Secretary Chu, is that he wants to do it routinely. He wants to take a, a nuclear steam generator, which is highly radioactive, and melt it down and uh, throw in some clean steel and spread out that radiation and then sell it back to you and me in the form of you know pots, pans, forks, spoons, or construction material. Now, I'm not a scientist, uh, but it doesn't sound like a good idea. You know, the, there's two problems. Uh, one is that any level of radioactivity, regardless of how low, is cancerous. Uh, that's from the uh, beer biological effects of ionizing radiation. But the, the other part of it is that uh, the history in India and China is that this stuff doesn't get smoothly distributed. So what the Department of Energy wants to believe is that this radiation gets averaged out over a lot more, radio, a lot more uh, iron and steel. But in fact, what happens is that it remains in lumps. So you may have some steel that's perfectly clean and another one that's, that's considerably hot. And uh, it's almost impossible to get a process that mixes it, sort of like making chocolate chip cookies. You know, you're going to get cookies and then you're going to get chunks. And those chunks of radiation, it's not clear that they get averaged out in the blender. So the silverware in my kitchen may be radioactive while the silverware in your kitchen is not, uh, even if they had come from the same batch, is what you're saying. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and you know, there's uh, what happened this week that really brings us to the forefront is that Congressman Markey from Massachusetts issued a press release and basically he said this is not a good idea. So I agree with Congressman Markey and, and uh, suggest that the Department of Energy you know, stop trying to sell radioactive steam generators into the waste stream. We have enough iron as it is. It's not like there's an iron shortage and we need to take all our contaminated nuclear material to make the shortage go away. There's plenty of iron. This is really a ploy by nuclear industry to make some money off of something that historically has been a liability. So let's just say I did, re I, I did have a, a radioactive fork. Um, you know, you've talked a lot in the past about the risks from an external exposure of radiation, uh, basically exposure to uh, gamma rays, versus an internal uh, dose of radiation, uh, such as breathing in a hot particle or swallowing a hot particle. Uh, in the case of radioactive metals being reintroduced into the uh, consumer product line, is the risk to the public mostly external or internal? I think that's a, a great question, and it's both. Of course, there's going to be an external exposure uh, just from having the pot on your countertop or whatever. But let's just say you're, you're cooking with it, and that, uh, that radiation then leaches out into the water, which then gets, uh, gets into your food. So it, it goes either way. There's not a lot of data on this because it's never been tried. But, um, and let, let's hope it never does get tried because... Uh, I don't see where it's helping you and me. Uh, it's not helping the consumer here to get any radioactive material in their in their baby spoons. The only persons that it's helping are the nuclear utilities 
that very much want to get rid of this material. So, so the, the upside of this argument is that utilities make some money. The downside is that you and I and our families run the risk of being contaminated. All right, Arnie, finally today, some news that you're actually involved in. The uh, San Onofre plan has been a topic of concern for quite some time. You've recently filed an affidavit stating that San Onofre should not start up until it's been relicensed. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, you know, I'm on a contract with Friends of the Earth, and uh, I was their expert last year who determined that Southern California Edison had taken a lot of shortcuts in the design of these generators that led them to failing. You know, they were supposed to last 40 years, and, and in fact, they lasted 20 months. So in, in that role, I've been, I've been retained and I've written four reports that are on the website. Well, I just wrote an affidavit in support of a legal filing with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So the legal filing is on the website, and also my expert report, and, uh, and another expert from England, a, a guy named John Large, so that there's uh, two expert reports in an affidavit that basically say the same thing, that the San Onofre plant, if it's going to run at all, needs to be relicensed given what we know about all of the shortcuts that they took in rebuilding these steam generators. So um, we'll post all those filings on the site, my affidavit, Large's affidavit, and the, uh, and the legal complaint in case anybody's interested in, uh, in looking at them. And what would it take for the San Onofre plant to be relicensed? Years ago, San Onofre made a decision that they didn't want the public to be involved. So they distorted the process and got their plant modifications approved without a public hearing. Had there been a public hearing, all of the right questions likely would have been asked. And it's, it's really likely that the problems at San Onofre would have been identified in 2005 or 2006, so that uh, now we don't have a plant that's uh, so severely damaged it should never run again. So they process should have been a public hearing with the NRC doing a thorough, thorough analysis of the license application. And that's all we're asking for now. So we want them to go back to square one and, and have the public hearing that they tried to avoid in 2006. You know, so in addition to filing this affidavit, um, I'm going down to Washington, D.C. to meet with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission next uh, Wednesday. That's uh, the, the 16th. So they've given me two, um, almost two hours to talk about my concerns on, uh, on how these steam generators were built. So in the next podcast coming up uh, next week, we'll have, um, we'll have some feedback about how that meeting eyeball to eyeball with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission really went down. And of course, Arnie, that presentation will be recorded and available via our podcast. Well, I guess that about does it for this week. Arnie, thanks so much for coming on again. Yeah, well, once again, thanks for having me, Kevin. And, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to next week when I'll be able to tell the, the listeners what happened at the NRC meeting. Well, that about does it for this week's show. You can catch us back here next Sunday and every Sunday for more discussion on what's happening in the world of nuclear news. For the most up-to-date information from Fairwinds, visit www.fairwinds.org. And remember, Fairwinds is spelled F-A-I-R-E-W-I-N-D-S. For Fairwinds Energy Education, I'm Kevin Hurley. Thanks for listening.